I'm Thomas Mann, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'm uh, Norm Ornstein, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and we are co-authors of the New York Times best-selling book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. Well, it's, it's become uh, sharper and more direct and obvious in the, in the 2012 campaign. Um, and I think that's uh, because uh, Governor Romney and the people around him um, don't believe that they can win using uh, uh, what they had hoped to before, which is the economy, the economy, the economy. It's a referendum on the economy. Um, but there's nothing new about that either. And I think there are a few things you could say. One is race is never far from the surface in society uh, or in American politics, one. But two, if you look at the things that were said about Bill Clinton when he became president and throughout his presidency, the active attempts to delegitimize him, uh, including a series of Wall Street Journal editorials that uh, hinted at the idea that he was an accessory to murder uh, when he was governor of Arkansas, um, really tells you that the blood sport that Vince Foster sadly wrote about uh, was there. The attempt to build not a broad coalition, but the narrowest one possible was Karl Rove's strategy in both uh, 2000 and 2004. Rove now is trying to rewrite that history, but there's little doubt that he saw the way to victory in 2004 was uh, to get 50.1 percent with Republicans and a few stray others if you could get them. But it wasn't an attempt to try and find the broad ground in the center. It was an attempt to keep it at one end. And, you know, the fact is both parties have uh, their uh, tough leaders uh, and strategists who are going to use whatever tactics they uh, can. But in this case, race is a part of this. And it's a dangerous game to play, not only because it uh, adds to the tribal elements here, um, but uh, to look at the larger focus as, that you've suggested, and it's not just race, we have greater uh, economic inequality in the country than uh, we have had uh, in the last century or even more. We are now on a par with Juan Perón's Argentina, and uh, it's growing worse. And that is not a formula for long-term stability uh, and satisfaction in a society. And if you play on those divisions... And, and in particular, if you want to pursue policies that are going to heighten the inequality, um, you're going to reap the whirlwind, and that's a real danger here. Just uh, if I could add a word to that, there's, there's some very interesting scholarship uh, uh, that's been done that shows a very close relationship over time with the level of economic inequality and the level of partisan polarization. Um, it also turns out that the sort of number and visibility of immigrants uh, relates to this as well. So it, it ironically, it, 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 it turns out that in, in times of economic inequality, the squeeze on the middle class, working class, uh, uh, tends to lead to resentments, and the resentments get sometimes directed upwards to the moguls, uh, the billionaires, but just as often gets directed at those who aren't like us. They could be immigrants from Europe uh, in an earlier uh, era, uh, or they could be blacks or Hispanics or or someone else, but the anti-immigrant sentiment coincides with the, the racial dimension and the economic inequality to, to produce a volatile uh, mix of, uh, of, of very strong uh, opinions and uh, resentments that, uh, that fuel the polarization going on. And, you end up getting very strange uh, coalitions. Who would, who would have thought that the Republicans' two major constituent groups, and this is the party of 
business. Uh, are evangelical Christians and white working class uh, Americans that that's the the core of their uh, of their vote, if not their financial support. Uh, listen, if you go back historically, the D Democrats have no reputation for fiscal probity. In fact, the Republicans were the green eyeshade party, while Democrats were trying to grow government and uh, oftentimes uh, not too much concerned with whether, uh, whether the books balance. But, but this really began to change in the late 70s. The Prop 13 in California, anti-tax movement, sort of resentment, and, and really led to a transformation of the Republican Party from one of fiscal probity and, and what we consider to be, quote, conservative, to a party that was dedicated toward cutting taxes, primarily. Uh, Jack Kemp, who was one of the champions of this policy, was never much concerned about spending. I mean, come on, spend. Uh, 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 that's no problem. It'll do good things and get the economy running. And, and, and that sort of carried on. So ironically, Republicans in government controlling the White House have shown little concern for balancing the books, while Democrats, and they don't care if government goes bankrupt because they don't like government. And uh, Democrats, on the other hand, wanting a a resource there, whether it's for social safety net or pumping up uh, infrastructure spending or whatever, just realize if things get completely out of, uh, out of balance, there will be no room to maintain, much less increase these programs. So Bill Clinton led uh, and uh, had a remarkable success uh, in doing that. And and George Bush came into office, and his first move was to, uh, to cut taxes. And when it came to spending um, for the wars and even an expansion of uh, Medicare with the prescription drugs, there wasn't any concern about paying for it all. Now, ironically, Republicans are saying, well, Mr. Obama is a big spender, and he's given us all these deficits. Well, that's not where the deficits, uh, deficits came from. And you can see the dynamic is the same, because Paul Ryan's plan and Mitt Romney's economic plan for reviving the economy and solving the deficit problem is to cut taxes, uh, not just extending the Bush tax cuts, but uh, going well, uh, well beyond that and having a asterisk as to how it will be compensated for by, by other things. So it's a radical restructuring of government assistance, especially for lower income families, the Medicaid, food stamps, uh, uh, and other governmental uh, activities, uh, uh, and lowering taxes. It, uh, it's, it's almost uh, uh, by necessity, Democrats who like spending, uh, who who created Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and and uh, and now uh, uh, health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, now feel obliged to figure out a way to pay for it because they know otherwise it will all all collapse. So they're the party with the incentive to be fiscally responsible now. You know, it's an interesting question. Of course, we start the book uh, by talking about the debt limit debacle. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, several dozen of votes on the debt limit uh, in the last 50 years. Um, and both parties have been utter hypocrites uh, in uh, carrying them out. Uh, you have lots of members when they're, uh, uh, the other party holds the presidency who vote against increasing the debt limit because they want to look like they're the fiscal guardians. And then they turn around and uh, uh, behave in exactly the opposite fashion when their party holds the White House. Uh, but what we've always seen in the past with both parties is that the leaders and many of the followers understood that in the end, you can play these political games. That's part of what happens in a democracy. 
but you're not going to endanger the full faith and credit of the United States. So the leaders had votes in reserve. Members could vote against the, uh, raising the debt limit to protect themselves against attack ads, but if you needed them, you would get them. This was the first time that you actually had the debt uh, limit taken as a hostage. And after it was over, Mitch McConnell said, uh, some of my colleagues thought that this was a hostage uh, worth killing. What we've learned is it's a hostage worth taking. And now we've got uh, Speaker Boehner, who in his uh, almost first act as Speaker-elect, warned his colleagues that now that they were going to be in the majority and that shared some of the responsibility, they'd have to behave like grown-ups, and that included things like uh, the responsibility for the debt limit. Now he's leading the charge to hold the debt limit hostage again. So it's an interesting question. If Democrats are uh, in the minority and it's a Mitt Romney presidency, would they do the same thing? I don't think so, uh, in part because I think you don't have the kinds of radicals like a Jason Chaffetz who said, uh, would we have brought it all down? You bet we would have. And uh, the Michelle Bachmans who think that it would have been good. And uh, I was at a, uh, a session at the Bipartisan Policy Center a few weeks ago uh, talking about uh, these issues, and um, a uh, longtime conservative Republican uh, who had been uh, staff director for a budget committee for many years said that when he was up on the Hill cautioning uh, the Republicans uh, that this was a crazy thing to do, uh, said he had one member uh, say to him, you know what, if we take our stand and bring the debt limit down, it will uh, improve America's credit rating. And he looked at him and said, do you understand what a AAA rating is? Uh, you can't improve the credit rating. And he had no idea what he was talking about. You know, you've got ignoramuses on both sides, but I don't think you'd have it. The danger here, however, is that the longer you go with a party acting in an irresponsible fashion, the more you're going to build in the likelihood of a counter-reaction. The more you have Democrats who say, well, look, let's try and work things out. And we've had many instances, David Price, a, a great political scientist and a terrific member of Congress, on the Appropriations Committee in the House tells all the time about working out bills in the subcommittee and appropriations where both parties are deeply engaged and they reached out and they take their ideas and they put together a thoroughly bipartisan bill and when it gets to the floor all the Republicans vote against their own bill. Um, how long are you going to do that? Uh, there was a piece by Bill Keller in the New York Times a couple of days ago about Ron Wyden who's now viewed with great uh, suspicion and some disdain on his own party for having given an imprimatur to Paul Ryan on the Medicare issue. But uh, Wyden has, for a long time, gone way out of his way to try and build uh, bipartisan policy uh, positions with unlikely conservative legislators. The point of Keller's piece at the end was uh, he may have made a mistake in this case, whatever it may be, um, people like uh, Wyden are uh, potentially a vanishing breed because how long are you going to do this if you end up being betrayed by the guy who you work your deal with and then vilified by your own party for doing it? So there's a danger here that this polarization could lead us into even worse territory. And if we go through a cycle of uh, uh, changes in government where the uh, uh, party that doesn't hold the presidency uh, immediately resumes a role of throwing grenades into the tent, uh, we're all going to get damaged. I think uh, the Ryan blueprint is, is pretty clear on this. It, uh, it, it really uh, leads us into an era in which Tax revenues for the federal government are, are south of 15% of GDP instead of north of 20%. When the main social safety net programs are changed from defined benefit to defined contribution, which, which means if you the primary route to uh, dealing with uh, increasing health care costs, which, which are just untenable, have to be dealt with, is, is cost shifting uh, to someone else where 
you reduce over a couple of decades the Medicaid program by 75 percent by turning it into a, a block grant with caps uh, to the states, then either the states are forced to pick it up or more likely you just com you just reduce um, the level of activity for those people. And remember, a good a good share of uh, Medicaid expenses go to uh, <coughs> older people who've spent out all their money and have to be in a in a nursing home. So, and where you have defense interest payments, um, your your vouchers for Medicare, your block grants for Medicaid, um, and then the room for the rest of government, everything else that you can think of doing. Uh, air traffic control, food safety, uh, infrastructure, education at the, at the federal level is reduced to 1% of GDP or less. I mean, it, it, uh, there is no room for anything else. So it really is, uh, if you will, a, a repeal of uh, the last century of, uh, of social and economic policy. It's a, it, 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 in, in many respects, Paul Ryan took Ayn Rand very seriously, and and uh, he trims it. Uh, he ignores the the religious side of it. Ayn Rand was an atheist and uh, wouldn't t cater much to Paul Ryan's strong uh, religious commitment and belief. But the rest, uh, he'd really go with. So that is the objective. No, and I, I think that's exactly right. And it's not just to take the country back before the New Deal, although. I think a lot of Paul Ryan and others would view the New Deal as a you know a terrible development uh, for freedom in America, but it is to take it back before the year of Teddy Roosevelt too. Right. Um, it's remove all of those regulatory uh, impediments uh, that uh, Roosevelt brought in. Uh, it's a it's a set of radical goals in a lot of ways, using radical means. And if there's a model for them now, it's Scott Walker uh, in Wisconsin. It is, uh, once you get elected, even if it's by a narrow margin, you muster your forces, you build in the same unity in the majority that you had in the minority, you enact radical policies, and then you lash yourself to the mast and believe that once they take effect and freedom reigns, then people will breathe that freedom for the first time, and if it takes a while for them to have their lungs react to it, uh, they will soon be blessing you for it. In the meantime, you build in as many uh, ways as you can to preserve power long enough to keep it from being reversed. And so, uh, of course, the Walker plan was to cut the pins out from under the base of support for the Democratic Party by uh, devastating uh, the public employee unions. You'd see that even more at a national level uh, if they took power. And at the same time, we see in a number of states uh, the voter suppression measures, not just voter ID laws, but attempts to cut out early voting where it would benefit uh, Democrats, to uh, cut out voters uh, who might uh, otherwise go for Democrats uh, by purging uh, voter rolls uh, pretty indiscriminately uh, when it comes to citizens versus non-citizens, and a host of other ways. And my guess is you'd see that at the national level as well, a little bit more of a backwater. Uh, it's a grand experiment if it happens, and uh, Paul Ryan talked about it long before he was chosen to be a running mate, and talked about how if they took all the reins of power, they would put uh, together the mother of all reconciliation bills using that technique that was used for the Bush tax cuts, as it was used for the Children's Health Insurance Program, as it was used for the Affordable Care Act, but in this case going way beyond them to implement this radical vision and, uh, and avoid a filibuster in the Senate. Uh, and uh, if they win the Senate, even by, the, by a narrow margin, win the House and win the White House, whether Mitt Romney wants it or not, that's the bill that will be sent to him, uh, and uh, he will, of course, uh, sign it. And my guess is that if they can't do it all fully in that fashion, and they would put enormous pressure on uh, the parliamentarians in the House and Senate, uh, enormous pressure on the head of the Congressional Budget Office to make sure that uh, they could uh, get the rules to work to their advantage. But if it wasn't enough, 
then you might see the filibuster uh, either eliminated or brushed aside, uh, believing that there's a narrow window of opportunity to do this radical stuff. The only element I'd add to, to that, uh, the means is where the money comes back in as well. We discussed that earlier, uh, but the Republicans, through the so-called super PACs and their affiliated nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, have gotten a sort of tremendous jump. Uh, uh, the press usually talks about this as outside funding. Nothing outside about it. Look at each of those organizations. These are run by party operatives uh, who've been very active working with the parties and their candidates. At, uh, uh, Karl Rove sort of is chair of a coalition of these groups. They meet regularly with their presidents and presidential candidates. Uh, uh, sort of democratic billionaires like, like Soros uh, are appalled by that role. They played this game back in 2004 differently in a more constrained way, and uh, they didn't like it one bit. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Adelson and uh, Mr. Ricketts and a whole host of, uh, uh, of, of other very wealthy conservatives are perfectly happy to write checks for 10 or 25 or 50 or a hundred million dollars, and that soon becomes uh, real money, uh, and is certainly part of the political strategy of gaining and retaining power in order to advance what we've described as a uh, radical agenda.